these people. And here's, one, here's a, a typical example sandwiched between a LinkedIn uh, request, you have um, this person who has invited me to submit a paper. You know the old adage, right? If it's too good to be true, it probably is. I mean, it, it, it's unusual that you will receive an email from the editor of Science or the editor of Nature and say, please, we love you. Come submit to our journal. That would be really awesome, but that doesn't really happen. Instead, if you see this already, that should raise a red flag. And uh, if you look at the journal website, which I, oh sorry, this is the email itself. This is the body of the email. And then there are some things here that Professor Marcelo Perlin pointed out that you can already see. First of all, he mentioned the title of the journal. One that sounds very legitimate, often with this, with this first thing, international, meaning that it, it's, it's trying to inter seem international. It reminds me a little bit of countries that call themselves democratic. The Democratic People's Republic, <laughs> and oftentimes, like, why, why do you have to say that you're democratic, you know? In this case, it, International Journal of um, blah, blah, blah. And the top journals in my field don't have the name international in them usually. They're just, you know, the Journal of blah, blah, blah. But often you see this, as Marcelo Perlin pointed out, the European Journal of blah, 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 or the International Journal, and the name sounds very legitimate. Sounds like a, a legitimate journal. Okay. There are a couple other things that kind of should set you off. First of all, this, this fast publication, if they mention fast publication, it should be another red flag. It's publication from submission to publication in 70 days is unusual for many fields, especially for a field like mine. Anything in the social sciences and the humanities, to 70 days to publication, that's, that's unheard of. Most times it takes at least six months uh, for an article that I submit to get published. And then, as Marcelo Perlin mentioned, things about English. So, like this, this stylistically, this greetings sounds very weird. You may not recognize it right away, but those of you who have a you know a, a good familiarity with between to distinguish between an informal and informal or formal and informal register of English, you know that to say greetings like that from an institution which should be a respected you know journal supposedly sounds strange. And there you have stuff that just sounds weird in English, like this. What does this mean? We are writing to show our deepest impression on your previous article titled. What does that mean exactly? We are writing to show our deepest impression. That sounds very strange. It doesn't make any sense. So as Marcelo Pellin pointed out, the English um, could be another red flag. And, and that, that sets off you know, alarm bells. So taken together, you have things like the title, you have you know, things like here, the, the style, the, the English itself. Okay, if you visit the actual website, which I did, I wouldn't normally do, I just did it for this class. Um, you have some other funny things. So you have, on the first page, you have uh, invitation to submit your article. Oh, this is still in the email. Sorry, this is still in the email. The other thing is invitation to submit your article and then join us as the editorial member or reviewer. So if you don't get if they don't get you here, they might get you here. Okay. So I visited the the website. And this is the website itself. So far it looks, you know, half decent. Doesn't look too strange, I suppose. But if you go, and this is what you all should do if you have a if you have a suspicion, you're worried, go into to look to see where it's indexed. So if you click on indexing in this case, here's a, here's a typical red flag right here. Whenever you see a, on a website, uh-oh. Parou a filmagem? Mas a filmagem está rodando? Okay. 
so I'll keep talking. Um, whenever you see on a website, when the in, if you look, if you click on where the the journal is indexed, and you see a bunch of colorful icons, that already should set off alarm bells. Usually, if you go to most sort of non-predatory, legitimate journals, you see just you might see where it's indexed, but you'll see a list. Just a plain list. You won't see all these colorful icons. And if you look closely at those icons, at those logos, you'll have your own, you know, you'll have different ones that are, that are famous in your area. Like in my area, in my discipline, you have Modern Language Association or the American um, Psychological Association, for example. In your areas, in your disciplines, it'll be different. But if you don't, if you don't see, if you see a bunch of different logos like that, it should, it should set off alarm bells as well. Okay. Then, as Marcelo Perlin pointed out in his lecture, another thing that you can do is look at the editorial board. So you can click and see who is the editor. So I did that, you'll see in a minute. I clicked on the, who's the editor of the, of the journal. And in this particular case, it says, uh, we're looking for an editor. We're looking for an editor-in-chief. And so you can apply to be an editor-in-chief. You can also look at who are the reviewers. And if, and if you see something suspicious there with the reviewers, like names that you've never heard of, or names predominantly from one particular region, it should set off alarm bells. So here's, here's that thing that I was talking about with the logos. And if you look, I mean, here's an example right here. I have never ever heard of Polska Bibliografia Neukova. I'm not saying that it's a bad indexing service, but um, I, I am very familiar with the indexing sites in my particular field, in the area of linguistics and applied linguistics and stuff. I have never seen that anywhere. And you can see a bunch of these. There's, you don't see Scopus here. You don't see, but you do see, you know, I, I think it's like a Japanese site here, um, a, a German site here, but things that I have never heard of. That should set off alarm bells. But it's funny how in so many of these websites where the predatory journal is, you see these logos for some reason. They like to, to use the logos as if that's going to give more legitimacy. By contrast, if you look at a legitimate journal like this one, the J Journal for English's Academic Purposes from Elsevier, and I click on indexing or abstracting, as I said, you just see a list. That's it. And here, you, here I see things that are familiar. MLA, Scopus, okay, so that's, that's a good sign. All right, so getting back to that website there, another thing that I mentioned, the editorial board, you click on that, and as I said, this one here, Science PG is calling for an editor-in-chief for this journal. That should set off alarm bells as well. And what's funny is that uh, you can look this up if, you, if you're interested. The New York Times published last year this article called Many, Any, Many Academics Are Eager to Publish in Worthless Journals. And there's an interesting, uh, an interesting anecdote here. It says, recently a group of researchers invented a fake academic, Anna O. Soust. The name is Polish and it means fraudster. Anybody here speaks Polish? You know that this means fraud, someone who's a fraud. Dr. Seuss applied to legitimate and predatory journals asking to be an editor. And she supplied a resume in which her publications and degrees were total fabrications, as were the names of the publishers of the books she said she had con contributed to. So the legitimate journals, the real journals, rejected her application immediately. But 48 out of 360 questionable journals made her an editor. Four made her editor-in-chief. And one journal sent her an email saying, it's our pleasure to add your name as our editor-in-chief for the journal with no responsibilities. That'd be great if all jobs were like that. <laughs> so, I want to work here. Great. You're welcome. Come on board and we'll pay you. You don't have to do anything. So that sets off alarm bells. And then if you look at things like the editorial board, okay, here you have 
Nefisa, uh, Nefise Saleh and, and somebody from Egypt. But then if you look at the peer reviewers, there she is again. That sends off alarm bells as well. It's very suspicious. Okay. On a personal level, I can tell you I have fallen victim to this. So some years ago, I was part of a research group, and the leader was in, in the UK. And, um, and he said, the leader of this group said, oh, you know, I have received an invitation to publish in a journal called the European Journal of Applied Linguistics and TEFL. Again, you have a legitimate sounding name. European Journal, it sounded good, and he said, okay, great, great. because it, this was a grant received from the ESRC, the European, um, uh, big US, European funding body, and of course, when you apply for a grant and you get a grant, one of the things they ask for, okay, what are going to be the outputs? What are you going to do with this research? And they always say, you're going to promise to patent something, you're going to publish something, and he said, well, great, this guy... Uh, Ron Carter said, we have, I've got this invitation and I'm going to submit to this because that way at least we have a guaranteed publication. Okay, great. So I wrote a lot of the article and if you try to look for this article today in the, like for example, the Portal de Periodicus da Capis, you won't find it. You can click on, you can go to Google Scholar and you look up this title and you do find it. But since 2012, by some miracle, it's been cited by three people. And that's only because the lead researcher is a really, really famous guy who's retired now. So, I mean, you put all this work into something to have it cited three times or none at all, and then I can't even download this article myself because it's the Gale Group, and I'm not a, I'm not a part of the Gale Group here. And... And I've, if, I try, if, I, if I try to put this in my lachis, it doesn't recognize it. It's very frustrating. But, you know, it was paid and that was it. And so that's what happens when you fall for these predatory publishers. Your, your science gets lost. And then that's a real shame. Okay, so let's move on to the submission process. So when you finally finish your article, you submit your article to a journal. The first thing, after you finish that, the first thing you got to do is submit a cover letter to the journal. And these are usually required by the journals. Sometimes it, there's a form online that you can fill out, but often it's something that you actually have to write separately. It could be in the email correspondence sometimes. Here's an example from the journal Molecular Biology. They say each manuscript is to be accompanied by an electronic cover letter outlining the basic findings of the paper and their significance two key things in this sentence. One is, it should be a brief summary, the basic findings, and two, what, why they're important, their significance. So those are the two things that you want to see in any cover letter. So today, I want to focus on these four things. Uh, first of all, what is a cover letter? Why is it important? What is a typical structure of a cover letter? A few important tips, and I'll give you a couple of examples. Okay. So why is a cover letter important? Well, first of all, it's your first impression. Think about it. When you meet anybody for the first time, you're making a first impression. Before, you're, before the journal editor looks at your manuscript, anything else he's going to see, or she is going to see, your cover letter. And what are some of the dangers? If you are submitting something in English, the journal that you've written in English, and let's say you've gone through a really th real thorough revision process. You've been very careful to put all your your periods and all your commas and everything, you've, you've gone to Kappa and you have, you've, you've, you've got this really polished manuscript. And then in your cover letter you got 20 mistakes. So the editor, the first impression the editor has is, oh my gosh, this person's English is, you know, bad already. That, why is that a problem? Because you've gone through all this trouble, all this work to make a really nice manuscript, really good English, and then you have um, unnecessarily gotten the attention in a negative way from the editor, who already, or the editorial assistants, who are already just getting 
tons and tons and tons of manuscripts every day. <laughs> they see one that has bad English in the cover letter, they could say, well, okay, this person's English looks bad. I'm sure, I'm sure that their English is probably not, not good either in their manuscript. So they're looking already for problems. They're already, they're already kind of sensitized to bad English from the start. By contrast, if you have a really nice cover letter, really good English, all that, or Portuguese, if you're submitting in Portuguese, then already you've made a good impression. They're not going to be looking for, for trouble or problems in your manuscript because they think, okay, this person is already, uh, looks pretty good so far. Okay. It's your chance also to vender seu peixe, to sell your manuscript, to say what, what is it that, why is it should, why it should be bought by the editor? Why is this special? You have to do that fast. Uh, you should also state that your submission is original. Um, and a, original here means that you haven't uh, copied it from somewhere else or you haven't submitted it elsewhere and that there are no conflicts of interest. What does a conflict of interest mean? For example, one of your, you have to, if you say that there are no conflicts of interest, that means that all of your authors agree that this should be submitted. Um, it also means that you have the permission from your institution to do so, that kind of thing. And um, if you have already finished your thesis and you've already finished your dissertation and it's an online, like here at the, you know, the, the library system at OFIPA, then it might be worth mentioning that this article comes from your thesis or your dissertation, because then the editor is already aware, okay, this is published, but it's not published in a journal. It's somewhere, just in case any plagiarism software picks it up. And um, it's worth writing it very carefully. And one of the things, a tip for you is that, you know, a lot of people use Kappa, uh, the writing center here, for translation and editing. But don't forget the, the cover letter. It's worth making a, a, an assessoria, a, a cap, a, a, a consultation, a tutoring session, 50 minutes max, for you to say, here's my cover letter, what do you think? Does it look good? It'll take you very short time, but it's time well worth spent, uh, well spent. But it's, it's a, lot of, a lot of journals want this too. Uh, or, Reviewers that you should avoid. If you know there's somebody who doesn't like you, so you can you can explain why, or you don't have to say, I prefer this person not see it due to a conflict of interest. Uh, one time, a, a personal example, this is many years ago, uh, I received a manuscript from a journal, and after I read the first paragraph, I realized it was from my ex-girlfriend. And we didn't finish well. It wasn't good. And so I thought, hmm, you know what, I can't, if I read this, I'm not sure that my decision will be totally unbiased. So I wrote back to the journalist, I think there's a conflict of interest here. Here's a, an example from my own, uh, my own work, my own uh, an example from my own uh, publications. So here you see, uh, I start with Dear Editor, because it, they were changing editor. You should usually use the name of the editor there. So we have the pleasure of submitting a phrasal expressions list for your consideration. The paper presents a corpus derived, derived list of five of the 505 most common, useful multi-word expressions in English. One unique feature of the list, called the phrasal expressions list or phrase list, is that since it contains frequency information that matches the top 5,000 word families in English, it can be integrated into existing word lists and therefore tests, graded readers, etc. As the phrase list fills a pedagogic need similar to that of existing lists such as the Coxhead 2000 academic word list, we felt that TESO Quarterly, where Cox had first published a work clearly, was the best journal to submit our paper to. This probably doesn't mean anything to most of you people. But what you can see is that first, there's a brief one sentence summary of the research, why it's important and why this journal. So here you have 
Uh, we have the pleasure of submitting. The paper presents a corpus-derived list of 505 most common useful word-to-word expressions in English. Boom. One sentence. That's it. That's what it is. That's what it's about. Okay. Very fast. Two. Almost like move to. Why it's important. Here. Unique. One unique feature of the list is that it blah, 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 blah. Again, that's the next sentence. That's sentence two. And then number three, why this journal? Uh, blah, blah, blah. Since uh, Coxhead published um, in TESOL Quarterly, uh, we, have, we are submitting to TESOL Quarterly. And that's it. Um, on our website, uh, well, you'll see it there. I'll show it to you in a minute. Uh, I have posted a downloadable template in Word that you can use, you can edit to help remember how to do this. So you just download this on our website and you can fill in the blanks here if, you, if it helps you. And here you can see the, the structure, the typical structure, dear editor, or the name, preferably the name, and then just some flexible slots. We are pleased to submit an article, report, uh, blah, 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 entitled da da da, etc. etc. But one thing I want to point out here is that here I suggest aqui use palavras or frases usadas pela própria revista no Ames and Scope. What do I mean by this? Um, you should say, you know, why you're submitting to this journal, but you can you can use some of the words and phrases that they use even on their website to help you. So here, going back to this journal, the Journal of English Academic Purposes. Uh, in this case, I would look at the guide for authors. If I click on that, I can download the author information. And in that, I can find specific words and phrases that will help me write why I chose this journal. So in this case, um, I download this, and there's a description of the journal. And here, you, here, for example, this phrase, uh, in the context of academic study and scholarly exchange. So whatever my paper is about, I can add this to it, and I'm, I'm therefore showing the relevance to the journal. So, for example, I can say, this is a study that uh, talks about uh, the publication, teaching a publication course in Brazil in the context of academic study and scholarly exchange. Ah, the editor will see, oh, this is appropriate for this journal. So think about, consider using the actual words used by the journal for that section, the section here. Okay. Now, after you have submitted your 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 article, then there's the waiting game. For some people, that waiting time is, you know, a nail biter. Other people, it's it's very easy. We'll we'll talk about that in a minute. But interestingly, um, if you look at several books and courses about how to write scientific uh, manuscripts. Often they forget this part, and this I think is maybe the most important part of the whole process, is how to reply when you get a reply. Because that's going to happen. You can submit it, you're going to submit your manuscript, and the journal is going to say, hey, we love it, you're accepted. Yeah, sometimes, more rarely. More commonly they're going to say, eh, it's pretty good, but... We want to change a couple of things here. And how you reply to that is key. That's really important. So. <laughs> yeah, you're going to see this one day, hopefully. A decision letter. A decision from the editor, and uh, you, you, you can just imagine, maybe this has already happened to you, but for those of you, it hasn't, it's scary. You don't know what it's going to be behind that, that click. You know, you're going to click on that, and, oh, what is, it, what is the editor going to say? Oh, you've been waiting for so long. And they don't say in the, in the asunto, they don't say it there, they just say, you know, decision. And all you do is you hold your breath and hope for the best. Uh, 
And I'm going to show you a decision letter from the manuscript I showed you earlier, the phrase list one. I want you to tell me, is it good news or not? Just read it. And what do you think? Was it good news or bad news? So if you think this was good news, raise your hand. If you think it was bad news, raise your hand. Uh, most, most people say it was good news, yes. I immediately said, woohoo! Oh, I'll tell you why in a second. The first word for the Shamada is uh, submission. Submission. excited? Why did I think this was good news? Because I immediately saw uh, they suggest revisions and then at the end they say revisions should be submitted. That means it's not a rejection. And I don't know I don't have the exact numbers on this but those of you who have been through this process before know that there's a, when, you when you deal with the revisions and the, the criticism the, the criticisms, if you will, that the um, reviewers have, there's a very, very good chance that the journal is going to end up accepting it. Not always. Sometimes the study is just not strong enough. But it means that you have a very good chance after that, when you, when you ask for revise and resubmit, to have it ultimately accepted. And so this is good news. Many people who are less experienced in the publication world think, if it's not accepted, it's bad news. No. It is kind of bad news in the sense that means that you have to go back and do more work. And, and in some areas, that's complicated because if, for example, one of the reviewers asks for more experiments, it means that sometimes it's, it's a lot of more work to do. Or maybe the cohort that you're dealing with, you no longer have access to and you can't do uh, what the reviewer is asking you to. Sometimes that's bad news. But at least in the sense of they haven't rejected the manuscript, that's good news. And in this case, I knew that um, I, could, I could probably very easily, not easily, I knew that I was able to change the manuscript. And so when I saw this, they want me to revise and resubmit, that was really good news for me. So that's the way you should feel in most cases, regardless if it's going to be more work or not, that your manuscript hasn't been rejected. Especially from, if it's from a good journal, which in this case... lots of things that need to be worked, but they say, we hope that, you, that we hope that you will rework the article. That's good news. So yeah, for me, happy inside. All right, so when you reply to reviewers, and you should if you get, uh, did, did you know that there's, a, there's research that shows that one of the, I forgot which area, I think it's in cardiology, is a cardiology journal that did this. The number one reason an article never proceeds to publication is not rejection, but because the authors do not revise and resubmit. 
So in that particular journal, I don't know if it's true for all journals, the number one reason an article doesn't proceed to publication is actually because it, they just never replied to the reviewers. So if you go through all that work, you, you should think about it. How do you reply? First of all, don't be defensive. As I've mentioned before, especially if it's your first manuscript, uh, this, this, this study of yours is like a little baby. You know, my son, he's, I, have a, I have a young son. Nobody can say anything bad about him. You know, if they say, oh, he has ugly... Everybody, of course, everybody always says, oh, he's very cute. But if one day somebody said, oh, he has ugly hair, I'd be, what the heck are you talking about? No, that's my, that's my baby. And for you guys, you're writing this, you're writing this research up. Um, it's very easy when you receive criticisms to be defensive and say, ah, it's obvious. What do you mean? Blah, 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 blah. It, it's there in the manuscript. Are you stupid? It's good to take a breath. Don't respond right away. Think about it. You're not going to win any friends or favors by being defensive. Also, when you receive a, a, the criticisms from the journal, often it's from two or more reviewers, um, don't feel that you have to reply to every single point. Don't feel that you have to address every, every single point. Um, we'll talk about that more in a minute. Also, don't feel that you have to automatically agree with all criticisms. They say, okay, you're right, you're right, you're right. That's not necessarily good either. And then, you know, as I said before, don't reply with emotion. Don't. That, that doesn't win you any favors. But you should start by thanking the reviewers for their time. Thank you for your, thank you for taking time to review. You should try to identify the, the main concerns. Because whatever, whatever reviewer writes her or his uh, criticism, their critique of your manuscript, even they don't prioritize it in their letter. They kind of often just you know, write several random thoughts. Sometimes they do. They say, oh, my main concern is this, and then they have minor concerns, but not always. So you should do that job of saying, okay, what is, what's, what is some of the main concerns? And oftentimes that means looking at reviewer one, reviewer two, and say, okay, what do they have in common here? What are, oh, and then you can, when you reply, you say, okay, we see that both reviewer one and reviewer two have this concern, and so we focus on this. So reply to the key comments. If you really do not agree with a critique or criticism, then stand, don't be afraid to stand your ground. If you really think that they have misunderstood uh, what you're trying to say, then, then don't, don't just say, okay, yeah, you're right. Especially if it's to the detriment of your study. If you have something that's really important that has been misunderstood and criticized, then think, okay, maybe I, I didn't make it clear. Maybe we didn't make it clear in the manuscript, but that doesn't mean it's garbage. It means that maybe you have to you know, explain it better. And then uh, make sure they respond specifically and in an organized way. Make it very easy to read. And I'll show you some examples of what I mean. So, uh, on our website, uh, in today's module, you will see, as I said before, you have a cover letter template which you can download. But also, I have put there three examples of ways that I have replied to reviewers. doesn't mean it's the best way, but it's, it's, you can use that as an example if you've never done it before to see ways, different ways of doing it. So, for example, in this case, which was uh, this article, a framework for the inclusion of multiple expressions in ELT, I gave subheadings. I was the sole author on this. So I gave subheadings and I, I first thanked the reviewers said, thank you for your constructive comments made regarding the manuscripts. They were very useful and all points were given careful consideration. You can, you, if you want, feel free to plagiarize this from me. That's fine. <laughs> I'm not going to sue you. <laughs> you can say the exact same thing. It may be, this may be a little bit, you know, it may seem to you now like, how do you say, book a book about Florida or something like this, but it's good to acknowledge their effort and show that you are grateful, that you're not angry, you know, you're, you're, so something like this is a good way to start. And then I say, please find specific replies to each concern below. Okay. 
And then, as you can see, I reply to the reviewers, first reviewer one and then reviewer two, and I'm very specific about what I'm replying to. So in this case, I write a uh, reviewer one comment. So this is the comment that the reviewer made. Um, <laughs> the statement that since formulaic language is associated with identity needs clarification. Okay, that's one concern. So then I clearly label here my reply to that statement. Uh, okay, and I explain. This point is drawn from a lengthy discussion, blah, 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 blah. And then below that, I write what the original manuscript said, which was this, and then below that, I say, okay, and this is the change that I made, right here. Now, I show that it's different. Theorizes, instead of argues, theorizes that since, and this was a key word, because it's a, it, it, it was a, you know, epistemological issue. But anyway, the point is, is that I show the specific comment, I reply to that comment, and then I say what the original one was, and then how it's changed. Very clear. And when I receive, as a reviewer, a response like this, it's, it's nice, because I say, okay, they took my criticisms into account, and they have dealt with each of them, you know, very carefully and very clearly. Not just, oh, yeah, we looked at it and we changed it. No. We make it very clear, very easy to identify what our response was and what was changed. This can take a while, this process. In, in the social sciences and the humanities, it can take ages. In computer science and many of the, 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 the health uh, medicine areas, it can be a lot shorter, depending. Um, but it can take a while. Because you have to submit the manuscript, then you get the reply back, you have to reply to that manuscript, and then sometimes they want even more change after that. And then you just have to pray that disaster doesn't happen, sometimes it does, which is the journal will ask the reviewers, uh, okay, uh, if the author resubmits, do you agree to see this manuscript again? If it's a really good manuscript, usually the, 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 uh, the reviewers say yes. But sometimes the reviewer says, no, I don't want to see this manuscript again the rest of my life. If that happens and you, have to, and you resubmit the article, that means that the journal has to send it to somebody else. And that somebody else has their own new set of criticisms, crit criticisms to make. And then, it's a, and then you start from zero sometimes again. So it can take a while, but eventually you eventually get there. It can be very grueling. Talking to me? No? Okay. Um, yeah. And this could be especially frustrating, I know, if you come from a program where you are waiting for this final acceptance so that you can get your diploma. There are some programs that require that, and that could be very frustrating. But just persist, don't give up. And then finally, you get this. Woohoo! I'm happy to be writing to accept your manuscript and tell uh, the comments, of, uh, and you can put this on your Facebook page, you put it on the refrigerator for your mother to see, and yes, you're done. You can go out and celebrate with your friends with any beverage that pleases you. Another example, yay, okay. Um, this, this process can be very tiring, and it's worth mentioning how it can be more frustrating for some than others. It's good to have for you to be aware of this. Um, in the Chronicle of Higher Education, there are a couple of researchers, Michael Dooley and Kate Sweeney, that published an interesting article last year about the stress of academic publishing. And basically, their study wanted to look at uh, what are the different ways that people deal with this process of submission and resubmission and all that? And they, they pointed out a couple of interesting things. First of all, uh, they cited an interesting study in 2013 of nearly 12,000 manuscripts submitted by the American Psychological Association, and they found this. 
76% of those articles were rejected. And so they say, most researchers under pressure to publish are familiar with the stressful experience of waiting or ruling all the while knowing that the manuscript into which they pour blood, sweat, and sometimes literal tears is likely to be harshly criticized and ultimately rejected. And, that, and that's tough because at the top journals, the rejection rate goes to 90%. And that's tough. This has two things, a number of things, implications for this. First of all, that if you do get rejected, it's not the end of the world because, you know, it happens to 90% of the people, especially the top journals. But also, if you have no experience and your first, and your first article is rejected, that can be pretty harsh because you don't have any experience of success yet. And so that's what they, that's what they found in this study. They say, um... Intrigued by the as that aspect of academic culture, our research team at the University of California, Riverside, <coughs> placed a mirror under the microscope to look at how academics cope, deal with the stress of awaiting manuscript decisions. We sent inquiries to academic email lists in dozens of fields asking researchers to tell us about a manuscript they currently had under review. In the end, 130 researchers answered the call. We asked them about themselves, demographics, academic position, personality traits, about the characteristics of a manuscript that they had under review, authorship order where they submitted it, and how they were coping, current emotions, strategies, and the uncertainty of awaiting a publishing decision. And their findings are very interesting. First of all, what do they find? One, that those with less experience they wait for that decision with the, with the highest level of anxiety. Those are the people that they submit a manuscript and they wait like a few days and they, kept check, they keep checking their email to see if there has been a reply. That's terrible. That's, that's torture. They also find that those with the least experience can also sometimes be overconfident. Why? Because... Somebody who has spent four years or more writing, a, you know, working on their, their thesis, a, a wonderful piece of research, they write it up and they're very sure that it's worthwhile. In fact, their banca uh, of their doctorado told them this is a great research and so they submitted it, it's going to be accepted. When in fact, those with most ex more experience realize that it's not like that. It's not so easy. Even if you really do have good research, sometimes it doesn't pan out that way. They also find that if you have at least one success uh, of publication, it makes it easier. So uh, if you know, if you, what they mean by this specifically is that if you've been through that process of uh, submitting and getting a revise and resubmit and submitting again and so on, that you know that there's a long process involved, that you're not, you're most likely not going to get an automatic acceptance. And so, uh, and you know that it takes a while, um, but, but in the end it's probably going to be okay. That makes it easier. They also find that there's a, there's a, there's a variable there that's interesting, which is investment. So if you're the first author, meaning that you've done the most work, or the second author, or so on, uh, then you're more likely to be more anxious because you've done... If you're just the guy who ran the statistical analysis and you're the 15th person uh, on, that, on the list of authors, then you probably don't care. You might, you might get a phone call one day, hey, by the way, the article, you know, put it on your latches. Oh, cool, thanks. But if you're the first author then you probably, oh God, you know, especially if you don't have, if you have a latches that has like one publication or nothing on it, then you're really, you know, hoping for it. So there's that, this, how much, in, how invested you are in it. And there's also a moderating ver variable of how important you think. So if you feel like this is like going to be a, um, this, this article that you're submitting is, is a groundbreaking piece and you know, you feel that it's really something that's going to be widely cited, it's really important, then when you submit it, you really are hoping that it gets published because you're really proud of it. And so how important the article is to you personally can make a difference too. 
Um, and those who have been around the block a few times are less likely to give up. And so, I mean, that's a really important message here is that, and why I'm bringing this up here, is that you probably will one day receive a, a, an email that says, please revise and resubmit. And you may receive an email that says we've rejected, but you just have to get back up on that horse and keep going because everybody gets rejections sometimes and, and everybody gets revised and resubmit. Usually that's the most common case. <laughs> so how do you deal with rejection? Here's a, you know, this, this comic character here, Peanuts, right? Um, and Charlie Brown says, here are some more letters from the editors. And then Pete and Snoopy says, oh, do they like my stories? Charlie Brown reads, dear contributor, who told you that you could write? Your mother? Dear contributor, we've seen better writing on license plates. Dear contributor, if you send us any more stories, we're coming out to your house and punch you out. Dear contributor, if you send us one more dumb story, we're going to have, your, have to nail our mailbox shut. And you see here there's a closet. I filed them with all the others. I have a file like this. <laughs> I have, a, I have a lot of these. And one of the things that can be tough when you're a new, a rel relatively new researcher is um, this here. Let me show you on our website. This uh, down here. Down here below today's module, I've posted a, a webinar that's going to happen next week. And it's on this idea of imposter syndrome. And I think I mentioned imposter syndrome earlier this semester, but basically what that is is um, the, the feeling that when that you are not a real researcher, and you're just, and then one day you're going to be found out. Somebody's going to discover that you're actually not a real researcher, not really. And and it and this this sen sensation, despite evidence to the contrary, despite that you have several patents that you have filed, despite the fact that you have books published, chapters published, and articles published, you, it, it can still persist. But it's even worse with you guys, most of you guys who have less experience in the publishing world, to feel like, uh, you know, I I don't know if I'm really a researcher. And this can make you feel bad about yourself. And if you get a rejection right away after you submit an article, of course, that's not going to make you feel good. But it doesn't have to be the end of the road. So if you get a rejection, of course, you have a couple of options. The most obvious option is, um, OK, I give up for this journal. I'll look at the comments, and you should look at the comments, the, why they rejected it, and I'm going to submit somewhere else. Didn't work out for journal A, now we're going to try for journal B. Because probably your research took a lot of work, it's worth it, so don't throw it in the garbage. Look at the, the reasons why it was rejected, try to change it, and then resubmit elsewhere. But there's other possibilities as well. And I'll show you what that is. So there's an article on uh, a website called Vitae. It's a blog post, and it's called Random Reflections on Getting Published, published in 2014. And look what the author says about this. It says, there's a wrong way and a right way to challenge an editorial decision. Now let's say you've received mixed reviews, or even primarily positive ones, and the editor still rejects your paper. The latter has happened to me on several occasions, and there's no denying that it's one of the most frustrating experiences an academic can have. <coughs> Why bother requesting reviews in the first place if you're going to ignore everything the reviewers say? You think to yourself, cursing the journal and the insanity of the system. Believe it or not, this does happen, where a, you have two reviewers, for example, both say, yeah, we like this, we like this manuscript, and then the, the journal editor says, yeah, actually, uh, it's not really strong enough for me. 
in that case especially, it's often worth appealing to the editor. Um, and when you do that, make sure that you don't do it, first of all, in an angry way. You don't say, you know, why are you guys so, so dumb? And No, don't do that. But you can say, uh, I can see, look, look for the weaker points. So I can see how we could have improved this. Well, why don't you let us try to improve this part here and resubmit? Um, it's worth appealing to the editor. I have done it before. I wasn't successful. <laughs> uh, but I know other cases of people who were successful, where they look at, they look carefully, because you know these people have a lot to do every day. But they take they take time to look carefully at the comments of uh, the reviewers and say, well, okay, yeah, you're right. Maybe you're right. I think if you change this, it should be okay. So don't give up necessarily. Okay, now on to your final assignment. You've come all this way, and of course you've always known from the beginning of the semester that the end of the road here was the production of a final article. Now, I know that some people here are already saying, probably most people here are already saying, ah, but I still have to run a lot of analyses, or I don't have all my data collected, or well, that's okay, no need to panic. First thing I need to say is that Throughout, throughout this course, what, we, what we've always cared about most is that you, that you learn, that you feel that you leave this class, this course, this auditorium, your computers, feeling that you know more at the end, or more confident especially at the end, than you were at the beginning. Because there have been some people who have said, oh, I, I, I didn't sign the Lisa de Presenza, or um, you know, I, I, I wasn't able to access that assignment on formative. Believe me, no one here will fail. No one here will fail here or watching remotely if we see evidence that you have tried throughout the semester. That's what we, that's what we care about most. So having said that, um, remember that your final grade is 15% participation, 35% introduction, and 50% is your final article. Okay. Now, your participation grade, what does that mean? That means there's not really points necessarily. It's looking at, did this person show that they have tried to, to be part of this class? So for example, did they, did they give feedback to somebody else on their article? Did they, did they show, for example, last, the week before last, there was an exercise on plagiarism. Is their name there? Have they gone to formative at least a few times? You know, is there evidence of participation? Um, did they turn in the introduction? And we'll get to that in a second about the final grade of the introduction. And then we look at the final article and, and what grade should be attributed there. This here, the introduction, that grade that you receive there, if it's a low grade, don't worry about it because <coughs> If we see that you have made a lot of progress here, oftentimes if it's between a difference, a difference between an, uh, an 8.5 and a 9 or something like this, um, we will err on the side of generosity because that's not the objective. We don't want to flunk anybody here. That's not what we're trying to do. So here's how to submit. By the 1st of February, so you have a couple of months to do this. You have more than two months to do this. Uh, I'm sorry that if you had beach plans and you wanted to forget this, you said you want to work on your article. Uh, by, this, by this date, you should send two, email, two emails. One email is going to be to your orientador with your article attached and a link. This link is here. At the top. Avaliação final orientador. What the, what your orientador or what your advisor is going to do is then they will read your article whatever parts you have, and then we'll, and we'll, using the criteria that are there, we'll give you a score. Now, let's say that you don't have a, a, a results section. 
or you don't have a discussion section. That's okay. You just have to be able to justify it. That's it. Say, oh, you know, well, I haven't collected my data. That's fine. Um, then you might say, well, then what's the incentive to have a complete article? Well, the incentive is that the, the more you have, the more feedback you're going to be able to get. And I think I showed you at the beginning of this semester um, about three months after the end of last year's course here, already around 20% of the articles that started in this class were, were published in the journal, or have been accepted in the journal. So it's worth thinking about how you can use this time to really work on an article that might get published. Um, so try to make it as complete as possible. On the same date, on the 1st of February, you will also send an email, or by the 1st of February, to, uh, to uh, our, our usual address with this article and your article attached to it. That's it. Uh, and your orientador, your advisor, has to complete the evaluation by uh, February 15th. So keep that in mind. Of course, we're not, uh, you know, ogres here. If something happens where, you know, your orientador's dog dies and can't, you know, do it, that's okay. We'll, we'll evaluate individual cases as they happen. But that's, that's what it should be. Uh, and then you should receive your final grades uh, by the end of March. So this is where you find the link, and that's how you send it to your orientador. Okay. Before we finish, we're going to do one last activity, uh, an exit ticket. This is your chance to try to remember a few key things in this course. This will be the last thing we do in this class. So what you're going to do is you're going to go to... menti.com menti.com and you're going to use this code here 81107 81107 obviously if you're watching this remotely you have an advantage because your internet connection is going to be better and you're going to see there uh, three statements one is, perfect English will improve my chances to publish. No one is born an academic writer, and the main cause of rejection is poor English. You simply have to say if you strongly disagree or you strongly agree. I'll wait a few minutes because people will start doing it now.
talk about this. The uh, segunda chamada, uh, the second attendance word, is rejection. Rejection. Okay, this is good. This is very encouraging. Let's go, first of all, that perfect English will improve my chances to publish. Nobody, well, very few people seem strongly agree with that. That's good. Because one thing that I try to impress in this class is that even though this is academic writing in English, escrita academica, in lingua inglesa, or whatever, uh, I wanted to show you, and I hope that I've been successful in showing you that even if you have perfect, whatever that means, perfect English, that doesn't mean that you're going to easily get something uh, published. Uh, there's much more to it than that. Um, second of all, and related to that, is this here, there's a strong agreement that no one is born an academic writer. Yeah, there are people who are gifted at writing, but academic writing is a very specialized genre, especially for research article writing. And then finally, I'm really happy about this, that um, there is this myth a lot of people have that, oh, uh, if I have bad English, um, or if I'm not a native speaker, then my article will get rejected. That's never, almost never, um, the main cause of rejection. Of course, there is something called a desk rejection, which is when you submit an article, and, the, and then the first person who receives it, the editor or the editorial assistant, sees that the cover letter and the, and the manuscript is so bad that they don't send it to review. And that's, that's just a... That's just a desk rejection. But if it goes to review, very, very rarely, in fact, there's no evidence, uh, really, that shows that that's the main cause of rejection. Okay. That's great. Second slide. There's only three. So there's a next one. How well do you know these terms? So cohesion, naysayer, hedging, plagiarism, and predatory journal.
Okay, there's a high degree of confidence in a lot of these terms. Uh, the weakest one is this one. And uh, I think I only talked about this in one of the classes, but basically it, it is important, especially in the context of the discussion section, which is the idea that there are certain linguistic devices that authors use to reduce the sound of being too confident. So, for example, uh, the, the phrase, to some extent, or it could be argued that these kinds of things, um, or adverbs like largely, you can go back to that class to remember, this was a, a good, especially, especially important in the discussion section. Um, the other ones are pretty, pretty strong. Okay, last one. I know how to structure an introduction. I'm aware of different kinds of titles. I know the typical ingredients in a discussion. And I have awareness of what are good and bad tables and figures. There seems to be a rough correlation here between the amount of time spent on something and its ultimate score. Where the titles, I think we spent a day, a class and a half. The other one was a special class about the tables and figures. But I'm really pleased that the, there's, a, there's a higher degree of confidence in the introduction and the discussion because those are precisely the sections that are the most problematic for most people and arguably uh, where that can tip the scales of a rejection in a lot of cases because if a person's not aware of why you're writing something, if it's not clear in the introduction what your contribution is to your field, or then obviously the motivation to read the rest is not going to be very high. And if you don't know how to discuss, um, you, that's, that could be problematic as well, added to other components that could be negatively perceived in an introduction or rather an article. So I'm really happy about, about this result. As I'm very happy about uh, the whole class here, though, this whole semester has been really great. I think I mentioned on the first day how, for me, this teaching this class is a real honor uh, for me because obviously all of you are from postgraduate programs. And uh, I, I have a deep admiration for all of your fields of research. And whenever I talk to anybody here about your studies, I'm always just so fascinated. Often I find myself saying, gosh, uh, I really hope that gets published. Or, you know, I, I, but that, that research makes my own research seem so boring. <laughs> your, all, your, all your studies are so, so great. And, and again, as I think I mentioned in the beginning of this semester, one thing that you all have, or most of you have in common, is that all your individual programs 
all your individual theses and dissertations, it's more than just publishing. It's more than um, you know learning how to write. You're you're wanting to learn how to make your space in your science to make your voice heard in a dialogue that's probably old and broad. And in the in the essence of that space that you're trying to create is you're trying to to make the world a better place. To put a kind of you know frou frou. You know, fluffy, duffy uh, spit on it. Uh, you're all trying to solve problems, um, and and that's great because I feel like I'm a part of it. And if I've been a part of you guys, you know, helping to solve solve problems, then that that makes me very, very proud. So if I I congratulate you all uh, for being here. And uh, and my my final my final word for you guys today. The last thing I want to say is. Uh, Thanks for the memories. <laughs> Thank you all very, very much. Thank you all. Thank you. I wish you lots of luck and success. And this isn't the end of the road, of course. You have Kappa, which will be around if you want to come in anytime, make an assessoria, make a, make a visit, and, and talk to somebody about your work. We're there, and uh, and I hope to hear more about you in the future. I will. We will be sending you a, a, a questionnaire at some point in the future. To ask you how your publications are going, um, how you how you feel about the class. So we constantly want to make this a better better experience for you. So we'll be in touch. See you soon. <laughs>